So I'm Josh Murphy with film Artificial that I made with Patagonia, and we're at the Friday Harbor Film Festival here. Artificial is a film about wild rivers and people and wild fish, and it really kind of charts the, the slide of, of salmon towards extinction and really the unwilding of salmon. And what we hope the film leaves people wrestling with is this idea of have we reached the end of wild? And if so, what does that mean? Because in many cases, with salmon, this icon of what it was to be wild, we've manipulated it to a point where it's no longer wild. And unless we can let go and allow it to return to being wild, we will watch the complete domestication and extinction of an iconic species. And with it, whole ecosystems that rely on it, including the southern resident killer whale. One method we have to consider is saying, how do we allow ourselves to actually engineer ourselves, humans, out? Because that may be the most powerful thing we can do. We're just not very good at it. One of the focuses in the film is the southern resident killer whale issue. And as we've seen wild fish decline, we see the decline of the southern resident killer whale. And only through wild fish will we see their recovery. Right now, more than 80%, if not 90% of the fish in Puget Sound are hatchery raised. And that's us creating a human construct to replace what used to be wild. It's not working. If it was working, there'd be no closures of fishing seasons. There'd be so many fish that we could walk across the rivers. And there certainly would not be a problem with southern resident killer whales. That's obviously not the case. So we need to rethink that story we told ourselves. 1991. 25 species or 20 plus species or I should say populations of salmon were listed under the Endangered Species Act. Not one has been removed from that list. Not one. Zero. And that's hundreds of millions of fish per year being put into waters in the Salish Sea specifically. And still no fish have been removed from the endangered species list. Why is that the case? It's because the fix that we proposed is broken. And only until we address that and recognize that wild is the way forward will we actually see change. Otherwise, it's more of the same. Many other killer whale populations adapted to eat uh, sea lions and seals. And these specific orcas adapted to eat fish all. And they were big fish. They were large Chinook salmon. And they had plenty of them coming from the Columbia River, coming from the Snake River into the Columbia River, coming from the Elwad River, coming from the Klamath River. There's a huge number of rivers that we're feeding these. And as we've watched the decline of those rivers, we've watched the decline of the, the, the whales. So we see the whales because they're charismatic megafauna that we think are beautiful. But through them, we see the degradation of all of these ecosystems that are feeding to them. So uh, we have to look at them and say, through them, if they're being unsuccessful, where are all the other places that are causing them to be unsuccessful? And that's what's really scary. You may not be that interested in orcas, but you may be interested in rivers way in Idaho. And orcas may seem like they are like a million miles away. But when you see what's happening with orcas, you see that that's indicative of what's happening in Idaho. And as we see what's happening with the, the Bonneville Power Administration and what the, has done to salmon populations, you recognize that while you might not even live near the ocean, you're in a landlocked state, you're still having an impact. And so I think, again, orcas provide for us a better chance to understand what's happening in microcosms all around. And if the environment can't support orcas, it can't support many other things. And that's the big problem. As we say in the film, specifically our official, the best hatchery is a healthy river. And a healthy river is the best thing for an orca. And so without a river that feeds wild populations of fish, we will never see the recovery of orcas. So you have to see the connections between all and understand and appreciate those. For those who would like to question, I will show you the information, but those who will never believe, I just say once again, if this was working, we wouldn't be having these problems. I have an undergraduate degree in wildlife fisheries biology from the University of Vermont, a graduate degree from Humboldt State University. I worked on the land-based fish farm in Ireland, and I managed the on-campus hatchery at Humboldt State University. I feel obliged to tell the story. I feel like I've had the opportunity to. I've had the privilege of education. I have the, 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 the appreciation of science, and I think if somebody doesn't, with all of those uh, opportunities, have the, the chance to, to make a difference, then I feel like it's a, it's a squandered opportunity. Humans are storytelling animals. 
Homo sapien is the wise. It's we are supposed to be the wise animal. But through wisdom, we're supposed to learn something. And whether or not we learn that through, through story, through film, through dance, through art, whatever the means are, the end is the same, which is our greater appreciation of what we know. But when we choose not to see something we know, we recognize that there might be an issue. And that's what's happened. When we choose not to see the inconvenient truth, as it was called, about what was happening with climate, <clears throat> we see what happens. So only through actually expressing the wisdom of the homo sapien can we actually make change. Otherwise, we're just an ostrich with our head in the sand. I mean, that's the metaphor. So, yeah, hopefully we can you know, be more than just crafty, which is what some people would call humans, and be wise. And wisdom means we have to look at the whole picture. We are in the technologic hub of the world right now. But with all of the technology we have, we still cannot build a flower. We have to put a seed into the soil and let nature do its work. There is a limit to which our technology will ever go. And we have to recognize what that limit is. And where nature, we have to rely on to do what it so magically does. And only then can we recognize what human constructs are good at and what nature is good at. That's what we need more of. I mean, we can design a really great rocket ship to get us to the moon and then look back and look at what we're missing and try to get back home quickly. <laughs> so we have this little tiny magical globe that's floating in a, a sea of nothingness, might, you might say. And, and when you recognize that, you say, wow, why, what are we doing? If we're thinking about short-term profits rather than long-term health of this thing that has sustained us since the beginning of time. And if we want that time to extend in the future, we better pay attention. And that's been said for a long time, but we're now actually seeing it, and it's coming up fast. I'm going home tomorrow to California, where we have crazy wildfires not far from my house. And we have to deal with that. Our power is being cut. We had a fire that was just a mile from our house yesterday that was put out, thankfully. But it's close, and this is real. This is not just, like, hippy-dippy, love the earth, because... Uh, I like patchouli. <laughs> it's because we need to do something fast to protect it. Otherwise, we risk what our long-term health is as well as the health of the Earth that gave rise to us humans. But remember, Earth was here before us. Ambition is what has propelled human beings, unfortunately. I mean, we, through territorialism and through our ability to try to survive when the odds were against us, when we, early on we created, a, I think, a, a an adaptation that allowed us to succeed, but that same ad adaptation multiplied by nine billion people doesn't work as well, and that's the problem. Like, we were never meant to be in the population densities that we are, so all of our tendencies when we were a much simpler, like, version of ourselves, now amplified by billions of time, have huge implications. It's been an amazing opportunity to be with a bunch of people that want to make a lot of change, and change comes with stories. And I think we have, through film, a unique opportunity to share stories that move people to actually make change. And that's what we try to do with our film, and that's what I think everybody here is trying to do, is use the power of storytelling. So hopefully that creates a conversation about the future of wild, because that's what it's all about. Wild matters. And the film hopefully gets us all saying, what is what do we want to see for a while in the future? Go to Patagonia backslash artificial. Uh, that's where most of the information about where the film is coming out, what you can do, how to get involved, how to source fish if you're going to eat salmon, because we can choose to eat salmon, orcas can't. That's what they eat. If we're going to do so, we have to really ask a lot of questions about where we get our fish. So Patagonia has information. There's certainly other places that have it. They've just done a really great job of pulling it together into one place. Wild matters.